All right, thanks everyone. I'm Patrick Tucker. I'm technology editor for Defense One, and I'm the author of, of The Naked Future. So uh, kick things off here really quickly. Um, this is sort of unusual. Usually you go to these things and the guy gets up and he's like, everyone turn off your phones. Everyone turn off your phones. I'm going to do something unusual here. I want everyone to take out your phone. Go ahead, take it out and hold it up. Let's take a look at these guys. Who, raise your hand if you've got a smartphone. Like, it's everyone. It's everyone in the room. You know, it was weird. Like, uh, uh, Pew has a, a survey where they measure smartphone penetration in the United States. And the last time they did, I think it was up to 70%. And in every room in Washington, D.C., smartphone penetration is 100%, which is, you know, just lets you know how that's going for Pew. Um, I've got one as well. I'm going to do something unusual here. I'm going to ask you all, instead of turning it off, to turn it on. Just turn it on for a second. Actually do it and see if you hear anything unusual. Nothing, right? No. I, me neither. Every time you do that, though, your phone is contacted by a cell base station. We all know this, but more and more that cell base station is contacted by another cell base station and another cell base station and an extremely wide uh, group of, of, of systems that are having a conversation about you in a language that you cannot hear. What they're trying to do is, is figure out how to vend service to your phone. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is this. At some point during the, the next eight minutes, someone's phone is going to ring. And um, that person either has to uh, get up and awkwardly walk through all of you to answer their phone as we look at them, or hang up on someone, and that will be delightful to us all. But if you um, have GPS on your phone, go ahead and keep it up. And I'm going to keep my GPS, I usually keep it off, but I'm going to turn it on real quickly. And again, I just want you to pay attention and listen and see if you hear anything unusual. Actually, I'm turning on the GPS on my phone now. It's nothing, right? Well, every time you activate your phone's GPS, it starts to receive signals from the global positioning system. It's, it's a system of, of satellites that uh, tell us where we are. Um, the military created this system originally so that it could help uh, find nuclear submarines. Um, we use it now to get everywhere that we're going. And this, in part, is how you get this figure up here. This is how we get 1.8 million megabytes of data that we create on a yearly basis. Uh, the vast majority of it is not collected permanently, only about 10% of it, and it's, most of it is streamed. But all of it says something about you. This is your metadata. This is the stuff that uh, we were just hearing about from, from Michael Rogers. Um, go ahead, next slide, please. Not sure how to, there we go. So you are big data. This is you. It's 65 billion location tag payments that happen annually in the United States, next. It's uh, 154 billion emails sent per day, next. And it is the reason why 90% of all of the data in the world was generated in just the last two years. This is you, this is your, this is what happens when you turn on your phone in a room full of other people and when you activate GPS. This is what you create. Um, now here's the weird part, now, next slide. This is a very small fraction of the amount of data that's going to exist in the digital universe in the very near future. Um, these numbers are from Cisco, and Ericsson has slightly different numbers. I think that they're both good. Cisco wants to make money off of this. 50 billion interconnected devices by the year 2020. That's all of the cell towers that we were just talking about, and the satellites in space, and all of your cell phones and your smartphones and all of that. Um, what strikes me as sort of remarkable is that when you get to write about 2008, you notice a something happened to the global population. We lost the war. We are now outnumbered by the number of interconnected devices. And we're going to get to 2020, and you get to 50 billion of these machines, cell towers, smartphones, satellites, pacemakers, all having a conversation about us, where we're going, and why. Now, earlier we heard from Michael Rogers, and uh, it's his job to turn all of that into legally useful signals intelligence collection for the future, right? Um, it's also the job of telephone and, and providers and, and service providers and internet providers to turn that into revenue. Um, and it's our job just to use it. So what I think is this, that the conversation we're having right now about privacy reflects something that's really unfortunate, but it's also temporary. We just feel all the time that we're constantly surrounded by an ever exponentially growing number of devices that are communicating about us 
in a language we can't hear, to parties we can't see. And there's just going to be much more of that. Next slide. That's why there's going to be 44 times as much digital information in the year 2020 as there was in 2009. If anything, this is an underestimation of the amount of digital information that's going to exist. Um, now, here's what I think. We have reached a really remarkable point in human history where we now create information about everything that we do, but we don't feel empowered by it because we can't see how we're creating that information. Um, and we don't feel like we're entitled to use it. We kind of feel like Mike Rogers gets to use it, but we're not sure how. When he says, I only use it, and uh, the law says I can use it, and we don't know exactly what he uses it for. We kind of feel like A&T uses it. We kind of feel like Verizon uses it. We don't feel like we use it, even though we make it. And that's what's going to change. That's what I'm here to say. I think that it is inevitable that that begins to change this century. We are going to begin to feel empowered by the data that we create all of the time, but it won't happen automatically. It has to be as a result of a shift in priorities. There has to be a legal change, there has to be a cultural change, and there has to be technology changes. All of those are in the book. Next slide. So to give you a sense of what that actually looks like, though, to give you a sense of what I think um, personal data used for personal good actually looks like, consider this. I talked to. Uh, uh, two researchers, 2012, Adam Sedelik and John Crum, and John Crum was at Microsoft. Adam Sedelik, uh, at the time, was at the University of Rochester. Now he's with Google. Uh, and they set out on a really remarkable experiment. Um, who here knows where they're going to be in about a year and a half from right now? Raise your hand if you know within a five-block radius within a five minute time window where you are going to be one year and a half from today. There's nobody, nobody knows this. We're carrying around a device that's working in concert with all the other devices in this room to know where we are and which cell phone tower is going to vend service to us, but no one knows where they're going to be a year and a half in the future. If you've got where you live and you've got where you work, you've got two data points, it's not enough to draw a statistically significant inference. That's all we've got. So these two researchers, John Crum and Adam Sedelik, they went out to prove that uh, with a large enough data set, you can actually figure this out. And uh, they took some Microsoft money, because John Crum worked at Microsoft, and so he had Microsoft money. And uh, he stuck GPS receivers on uh, a pretty wide group of, of subjects, and he just watched them go around, he just followed them for a long period of time. Some of them were trucks, some of them were individuals just walking around, um, and, and some of them were uh, like delivery folks. And they observed that with 3,200 days of GPS readings, it's a, it's a lot, it's, it's like five years, uh, they could predict with higher than 80% accuracy where someone was going to be like a year and a half into the future. Um, now that 80% speaks to, uh, as opposed to 100% speaks to the uncertainty that just pervades modern life. Not everyone is perfectly predictable. We're a lot more predictable than we actually think we are, and that opens up when we begin to see what our data actually looks like for us. Um, so I, I think that this is incredible. This is pretty much what, what the entire book is about, is how you would use this type of information that is generated by you um, in order to achieve what really can only be called superpowers. I mean, the ability to know where you are going to be a year and a half in the future is a superpower. This is why we're also worried about who has that power on us. We never stop to think, well, maybe soon it will be me. In order for us to really take advantage of this, I just argue for three things. Number one, we have to create uh, new legal tools to help people share information. I think that that's the next step in the privacy debate, and it's one that has to happen, has to happen legally. Um, so that when you share information, you are legally protected from being a false positive in some sort of like law enforcement uh, type situation. You are legally uh, protected from any sort of discrimination. This is something that has to happen. The 2009 non-discrimination, Genetic Non-Discrimination Act is a great example of that. Um, we have to create technological tools that allow people to see their data exhaust, to see where all their data goes that actually starts with encryption in many ways. Uh, the uh, black phone from uh, Phil Zimmerman allows you to do that. It's an encrypted phone, but you can see exactly what all of your apps are doing, where they're getting data and where they're sending that data. I think that's one piece of it. And lastly, we all have to decide that we want to take a part of this, that we want the superpowers that our data actually unleashes. 
because, I mean, you've seen the numbers, 44 times as much digital information in the year 2020 as we had in 2009. We can all get up and take our smartphones and throw them into the sea, and that number won't change. We're just going to be creating infinitely more data than we were, you know, at the dawn of history. We're going to be creating several factors more in just a couple years than we were. Um, there's no law that's going to stop that or protect it or, or change that at all. It's something that's going to happen, and it can yield a lot of good. So we create information in everything that we do. Um, all of it is useful. And that's all I would ask for you to consider today. Thanks.